Isaiah 43, and uh, we always want to mind the Spirit of the Lord in this place. And uh, the day the program is bigger than the person of the Holy Spirit, we can shut the doors down. There's no program that supersedes the Holy Spirit of God moving on the hearts of people. He didn't say, without me, you can do a little bit. Without me, you can do nothing. Nothing will be done to honor and glorify the Lord without the Spirit of God. Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. And I'm glad he does know our name. Verse 2, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. Now I want you to look at verse 10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed I don't care what the, the Mormons say, that there are little, that we all can become little G gods and we can all uh, one day uh, um, evolve into God and that Jesus actually is the devil's brother and that he's one of many little gods. I want to say that's a lie straight out of hell. There's only one God and his name's Jehovah. And uh, there are not many little G's, and you're not one day going to reach some spiritual nirvana and, and become God. Uh, there's only one. And uh, he said, I, I, you are my witnesses, and uh, there's nobody like me, and I'm glad there's not. <laughs> In verse 11, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was I am he. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work and who shall let it? Or in other words, who shall stop it? Verse 14, thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and have sought down or brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cry is in the ships. I am the Lord, verse 15, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. Thus saith the Lord, which maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, which bringeth forth a chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together and they shall not rise. They are extinct, they are quenched as tow. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old, Behold, I will do a new thing now. It shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God says, I, I will do a new thing. And uh, typically, as we understand new, there is nothing new under the sun. And I know many years ago, you, you all remember, those of you who are Coke connoisseurs, how many of you, everything you drink is called Coke, whether it's Coke or not? Anybody like that? I know there's more than one, too. How many of you actually like Coke? Like Coke is your fate. Coke is it. Okay. No Pepsi for you. Coke. Okay. You remember when they made that new Coke? How many of y'all remember that? Does anybody remember new Coke? And uh, it was nasty. And they about lost the ship on New Coke. And uh, glad was the day when that guy was fired and, and they got back to classic. And uh, they about lost the whole co company over, over New Coke. A lot of things you can mess with with people. Food and drink are not one of them. <laughs> and uh, they, they tried New. And that's always dangerous in the hands of of human frailty. 
But with God, all things are possible. And so if God says, I desire to do something uh, new in you and through you, God is certainly able and capable to make that happen and to perform that until the day of Jesus Christ. If God says he can do something new, he certainly has the power, he has the wherewithal, uh, the knowledge, he's omniscient, he's omnipotent, he can do anything he wants to do. And I came here to tell you this morning just to remind us that God can do anything he wants to do. Don't ever limit God to something you've seen or heard or somebody that said something to you or something you've seen on TV or that's irrelevant to God's word. I want to say God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we're able to even ask or think according to the book of Ephesians. He can do anything that he wants to do. And he's talking here in the context of the scripture. This is uh, those of Israel who um, delivered from Babylonian captivity. And uh, God, these are folks who came across the Red Sea. And uh, so God is is saying some things to them uh, in chapter 43. And he's rehashing and going through the history just for a moment a little bit and reminding them of all that he's done. And uh, I want to say here in verse number one, uh, the Bible says, but now thus saith the Lord that created thee, Jacob, and that he that formed thee, uh, God God made, and uh, I'm not going to get on a, on a soapbox this morning. Those of you who have uh, are not in a coma, and you, I mean, you understand you have a brain this morning. You know that uh, babies in the womb are humans. Life is in the womb. And uh, you know, it's funny how we can find a piece of bacteria on Mars and say there's life on Mars, but you take a heartbeat out of a baby in a womb and say it's not life. You know how crazy that is? We live in a, I mean, a stark, crazy world. There's nothing to do about where life starts. They know where life starts. They just don't like the answer. It's like you and I, when we get in trouble, we understood the rules. We just didn't like them. We wanted to break them, so we act like we didn't understand them. Oh, is that what you meant? I thought you meant this. You knew exactly what we meant. They know where life starts. Some of these people have PhDs, and and they they understand where life begins. They just don't like the answer. They don't like to be subject to anybody but themselves. And I'm here to tell you, if you think you're going to kill babies and get it out of and escape the judgment of an almighty, all-seeing, all-knowing God, you got another thing coming. He said, I I formed you, basically molded you, squeezed you. He said, I I formed you and this nation. He's talking about the formation of it almost like a potter in clay. And he said, I've I've made you. And this is not necessarily the creative side of it, but this is the forming side. He said, I I have formed you. I have created you. And God goes about every day putting things in our life, putting people in our life, putting circumstances in our life, influences in our life to make us those of us who are saved, the children of God, that he desires us to be. Uh, There's no self-made believers. There's no self-made men. Uh, It's the mighty hand of God on us uh, that makes us, and by the way, there's nothing good about any of us except Jesus Christ. He says, I have formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. So he's declaring here, uh, his, his faithfulness to his people. I've called you by name. That's personal. And I'm glad we are God's sheep and we're not just some abstract idea uh, in God's economy. In the mind of God, we're the apple of his eye. We're very precious and cared for by God. We're not just some amoeba out here floating in a matter, in, in a sea of matter. Uh, we're somebody to God and we matter to him. He says, I've called you. You matter to me. This is a personal relationship spoken of here in verse 1. And I understand in the immediate context, this is to the nation of Israel. But certainly, uh, God knows you. If you've been redeemed by his blood and bought uh, by the price he paid on Calvary for you, he knows who you are. Your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. It's been written down. Thank God for that. 
He says, I, I know you. And then he says, when all of these things happen, as been evidenced in the life of Israel, when you pass through the waters, he says, I'm there. The stuff that's rough, but you can get through it, he says, I'm there for that. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow. He said, even, even when, you, when you think uh, that, that it's going to overtake you, he says, I'm, I'm there. Better than Liberty Mutual, amen? I'm about tired of them Liberty Mutual commercials. <laughs> when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. And uh, I want to tell you this morning, if you're God's child, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. I don't know what's happened or what's happening in your life, but I want to say, he says, any of these external elements are no match for me. He said, these elements that seem overwhelming and overpowering to you, he said, they're no match for me. When they, when they even come in the realm of you, he says, guess what? I was already there. I'll be there. I'm going to be there. I'm there when you're going through it. I'm there when you're coming out of it. I'm there right in the middle of it. And he said, I mean, he has the dial on the flame, and uh, he knows exactly when to turn it off, turn it down. And uh, he knows when to stop the waters, when to start the waters. He knows knows all of that and there's nothing that's going to come to you and overtake you that doesn't have to go through the mighty hand of God a loving heavenly father not some distant Abba but a a father whom we say Abba father a term of endearment hey he's not going to let anything he's not there playing with us and toying with us in our life and seeing who he can destroy that's Satan's job But he's loving and and nurturing us. And we see the faithfulness of God in these verses, how that he's going to be with us no matter what's happening. When things are overwhelming, in this life, I'm going to tell you, it gets overwhelming. How many of you have been through some stuff you never thought you would ever went through? Guess what? You got through it. You're here today. Why? Because he said, I'll be with thee. So the next time the water comes, hold on, don't get too nervous because he was with you the first time. He'll be with you this time. When the fire gets hot, hell, oh, he was here the first time. He'll be there this time. He says, I'll I'll be with you. Even, and he said, the flame's not going to kindle upon you. He's in control of it. And there'll there'll be testing days, but the emphasis here is when thou passest, notice this word, through. And through the rivers. When thou walkest, notice again, through the fire. Spurgeon said this, I owe more to the fire, the hammer, and the file than anything else in the Lord's toolbox. Because that makes and shapes who we are. But he said here, you're going to get you're going to get through every one of these. In verse number eight. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. We see first the, the faithfulness of God. We see the forming hand of God. And uh, now he's got a, he's got a faithful um, allegiance here. Th- these people, and, and it was kind of strange. We said, you're my witnesses, say the Lord. And uh, in verse 8, they have eyes, but they can't see. And they have ears, but they can't hear. So there's no problem with the creator. And as we come to verse 10, it's almost like a courtroom setting. It's a courtroom setting. And these people are going to be, he said, listen, and and the reason God says they have ears and they have eyes, there wasn't a defect in the creator. He said, if they didn't see, it wasn't because they didn't give them eyes. Israel, when you didn't see, it's because you chose not to see. And Israel, when you didn't listen, it's because you chose not to listen. So let's not, let's not you know, blame all of our calamities on the Lord when it's choices that we've made. But he says here, I'm gathering basically in verse 10, ye are my witnesses. So can you imagine the courtroom here and, uh, and God has people here who can't see. They have eyes they can't see and they can't hear. I mean, those are, those, he said, I, I'll do, I'll use people like that as my witnesses I'll use whatever it is that that I have to be witnesses and he said but he would rather he would rather 
Use you and I. We are his witnesses. If anything in this world, um, we need to be God's witnesses. And we, we cry against the lady in Virginia, and we ought to cry against her, and we ought to cry against the New York, and we're going to, and I'm going to as long as I have breath. And uh, we ought to cry against wrongdoing wherever it may raise its ugly head. But I want to tell you, uh, God, we are God's witnesses. Those of us who have been born again, we are witnesses to God's sovereignty, and we are witnesses to God's goodness and God's mercy and you know they didn't build I, they didn't build altars in Babylon but God still showed them mercy and God shows us mercy even when we don't uh, deserve it but he said here I'm going to I'm going to create a group of witnesses. I want to say to you, I don't want God to have to use something like that to be his witnesses. When you and I, uh, whom he has redeemed and bought with his precious blood, uh, may we sound forth the fact of God's goodness and the fact of God's redemption. God shouldn't have to uh, get some substitute witness when you and I have been redeemed by his marvelous grace and we won't even open our mouths to say, we'll go to the restaurant and not say a word about the Lord. We'll go out to Walmart not say a word. Uh, we'll go to our family meetings and not say a word. We'll go to, the, to this meeting and that meeting and this place and that place and not say a word. We'll go to work and work all day and never say a word. Hey, that's not a faithful witness. He said, I, you know, if the worst case, I can create a witness out of anything. And in the New Testament, hey, I can make the rock crowd if I need to. Oh, how pitiful it is to think that the God of the universe and the God that, I mean, May the 4th, 1986, when I was born again, God did something for me that no one else has ever done. God showed me his love in a way I'd never been shown love before. And to think that God has been so good to me and that I can't even open my mouth. It's funny, we don't get locked jaw about football some of you are going to talk about football today and you've never talked about it all year. You don't know the kicker from the punter. And you're going to talk about football today, but you know Jesus. And we've yet to speak of him. We've yet, we've yet to declare his goodness in our life. I mean, just think, and I've said this before, and I said it last night at the nursing home service but if you really want to identify the goodness of God, just think about the absence of his goodness. Think about the things that you would not have or would not have participated in or would not be today if it were not for the grace of God and how he loves us and how he's cared for us. And, and as, as Jacob is how I formed you, I've taken time and every day of our life, uh, we think we're in control. We think we're in the driver's seat. I want to tell you, if God took his hand off of your life for one nanosecond, uh, we'd be dead. Uh, and, and listen, every day of our life, he guides and guards and protects us. And the least we can do is speak of his name. He said, Israel, I want you to know I brought you through some rough stuff. It was me in the water. When the waves were high, that was me. It wasn't some cosmic force. It was me. It wasn't Mother Nature. It was me. When the fire was licking around your heels and you were in well nigh gone, he said, it was me. I was the fourth man in the fire. So let's not be so quick to forget when things are going well that, hey, it was God that brought us through and how quick we are to shut our mouths and to stop our praises unto God. May we open our mouths and open them wide in praise to our God. It's funny, we're quick to talk about everything in the world but the Lord. And he said, Israel, I want you to know I could have, I, I'm the one that raised up these nations and have thrown them down. I've directed your steps. The least you can do is be faithful to me in witnessing. You're my witnesses. That's what he told the disciples. That's what he tells us today. We are his hands and feet. We are his mouthpieces in this world. And we can decry all the wickedness and immorality we want to. But when is somebody going to stand up and, and talk about 
the Lord and his goodness and his mercy. When's the last time you talked to your boss about the Lord? When's the last time you talked to a coworker about the Lord? Oh, you don't have to, you don't have to steal time. Well, it's funny, we get real spiritual when we talk about, oh, pastor, I just believe that if I'm working for a man, I ought to give him an honest day's pay and an honest day, you know, honest day's work for an honest day's pay. That's fine. Do you want to check your fa- Facebook? That works real great till you want to check social media and see how many likes you got real quick. Works wonderful till you want to call and see what's for lunch at your favorite restaurant on company time. You want to make five appointments on company time. You don't actually go to the appointments on company time, but you make them on company time. It, that, that's wonderful. But don't ever speak about Jesus. Don't give a track because you're on company time. It's funny, if you got a side business, you have no problem giving your business card on company time. But boy, when we talk about, listen, we, we find ways to do what we want to. May God in heaven help us. Who else is going to cry out? This God denying, immoral, ungodly world is not going to speak of the goodness of the Lord. Matter of fact, they've not experienced it. You and I have experienced, I mean, the wages of sin. We've experienced the wages of sin and the fetters of sin being broken from us. We've experienced it. Who better to eloquently say where God brought me from and what he did in my life than me and you who've been redeemed by his blood. The angels know not of redemption, yet day and night they're crying, holy, 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 but they've not been redeemed. And we'll sit for days and weeks and never speak his name or never tell about his goodness to us in our life. Oh, people think I'm a fanatic. Well, if you're a Patriots fan, I guarantee you'll have on a shirt today. Wouldn't want anybody to think you're a fanatic. You better not wear that. How foolish. It's foolish in every realm. I mean, we, you know, we, we relegate spiritual things over here to a corner. It ought to be the focal point of our day. Thinking and, and remembering and rehearsing all that God has done. And he says, verse 11, I even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, and I'm glad he has. Nobody's done for you what the Lord has done for you. Nobody. And then in verse 15, uh, 17, which bringeth forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. Remember the Red Sea, that was me. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise there, extinct there, quench his toe. He said, they are no more. He said, remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Now, when, when Paul was talking about forgetting those things which are behind, you know, it's, it's impossible for the human psyche to really forget anything. Don't be shocked this morning. It's impossible to really drive anything you can suppress. You can suppress things in your mind and try to relegate them to the closet of your mind. But really, there's no guarantee of you ever forgetting anything. I mean, like being, this is like a computer. Nothing's ever really gone. Oh, I, I deleted, I went here and deleted. Wonderful. It's still somewhere. It's still somewhere. But you know, he's not saying necessarily. Uh, because he wouldn't give us an impossible, an impossible request. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What, what Paul's talking about there and what, what we're talking about is not that I just repress and suppress those things in my mind. It's, it's when I do go back, when they do come up, when I do remember, when in Satan's uh, I wonder at bringing up and resurrecting things that were long gone. He's a wonder at it. Are you telling me he can't bring something? That, yeah, oh, he knows how to do that. And, uh, and it comes to your mind. He's saying, hey, I, I want you to, to remember ye not. In other words, when it comes up, Think about the forgiveness that goes along with it. Think about the fact that I've already forgiven you for that. 
And uh, yeah, you may have a, a slip and a lapse and it may come up in your mind, but when, I, when the devil comes up and says, hey, you remember that? Well, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I do, but guess what? I'm cleansed. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, I remember. And uh, Paul, what he rehearsed, he rehearsed uh, that, uh, 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 that road a lot, didn't he? I mean, he rehearsed and rehearsed, and uh, I was coming down the Damascus Road. He rehearsed that. And he talked about it. He talked about the light from heaven shone, and he talked about, he talked about how he persecuted the churches. So he, he remembered it, but when he, when, he, when he remembered, he said, oh, wait a minute, but all that day, yes, I persecuted the churches. Yes, that really happened, and you can't deny reality. I mean, honestly, you can't deny things that have happened in your past. You can't deny it. It's a fact, but what you can do is say, yes, you're right. Yes, it happened. But over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ bled and died for my sins and not for mine only, but for the sins of the whole world and not just past sins and not present sins and future, but all the sins of the whole world. He died for them. And on May the 4th, 1986, I bowed my head and trusted Christ and he washed them away in his precious blood and they're buried in the sea of God's forgetfulness never to be remembered again. As far as the east is from the west, they're gone. So you don't repress them. You just take him back. Okay, if you want to bring that up again. It's like always having to call your older brother in to whoop a bully. He talks big. I mean, he's big time until big old Bubba shows up. He's big time. I mean, he's, he's roaring. You know the lines that make the most noise, ones that don't have teeth. And so he's roaring and uh, all and okay, we're gonna have to do this again. Abba, Father. Well, I know what He's saying is right. I don't deny it, Lord. I remember the day when You forgave me my sin. You come to live inside of me, and all of a sudden, when the presence of the Lord fills the room, guess what? He's gone. He's gone. He can't hang around. He's gone. The sins are gone. So when he comes attacking you and telling you this and that, you know what? He's probably right. But we have an older brother. We have an advocate with the Father who pleads our case. Hey, Peter, Satan had desired to sift you as weak, but I prayed for thee. I'd rather have Jesus pray for me than anybody in this world. Amen. Hey, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. In chapter 43, look again. In verse 18. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Don't, don't, don't get hung up in there. Don't, don't go back to bondage. Don't, don't, don't go back to, to guilting yourself about those things. Yes, they happen. Yes, it's a reality. But don't get back into bondage. Don't get into the yoke of that bondage again. Don't fall into the cape of that guilt again. That's what he's saying. He's not saying just suppress it, repress it. Uh, it's going to come up. But when it comes up, don't get back under the bondage. Just remember the price that Jesus paid. It's been covered. It's been forgiven. Hey, you're free from that guilt. Just take him back to Calvary. He's not saying repress it. And he's saying, behold, I will do a new thing. He said, I, I'll do a new thing. And what, what could be greater? He, he rehearsed the Red Sea. What could be greater than the Red Sea? Hey, freedom from Babylon. Done. Done. The millennium is to come. So what do we need to do? We need to understand God's faithfulness. We need to understand God's forming power. We need to understand that we are to be faithful witnesses to him. We need to understand uh, to, how to forfeit the future to the hand of God. He says, I want to do something new in your life. 
Some of you right now are wondering, and, and you need to you need, just forget about the past in a sense. Take him back. It's paid for. Listen, last year's over. Last month's over. Last week's over. Hey, plead the blood. And if you haven't, get it right. Get it under the blood. But he says, hey, I desire to do a new thing. He says, I want to do something. I want to do something great in your life. Forget the failures of the past. Hey, let's be a faithful witness. And then let's forfeit the future to the hand of God. Claim the promises of God. Leave it up to him. I don't hold tomorrow, but I know who does. And I want to leave all of that up to him. And God desires to do a great thing. And I want to say to you, some of you are bogged down in the past with a guilt, with a shame, with the event that not, have not been uh, lined out, they've not been worked out. I want to say get them under the blood today so that you can go forward and go on. He said, I want to do something new. I want to do something great uh, in your life, but you've got to be able to, you've got to be able to forget about, you've got to put that behind you through the blood. If you're here and you're not saved, you're never going to go forward until you get it settled about your eternal salvation. If you're here and, and your, whole, your life just seems like you're, you're stuck. You're stuck in neutral. You're pressing the gas, but you're not going. God desires to do something new. And, and again, there's no new things, but a renewed idea, a renewed vision of what God can do in your life. Some of you need to pick up your Bible again and start reading. Some of you need to revisit the prayer closet. Some of you need to go back and get out and witness and tell of his goodness and tell of his mercy and tell of his grace. Hey, forfeit the future to God. I don't know what happens tomorrow, but I know God loves me and I know he cares about me and I know he's gonna take care of tomorrow. I don't have all the answers answers about tomorrow, but I have the answer for today, and his name is Jesus Christ, and I'm going to lean on him. I'm going to give it to him. I'm going to relinquish my rights and give up my worries about tomorrow. I'm going to forget them and forfeit them to him. I'm up against it. I don't know what's going to happen. Rest in the everlasting arms of Jesus Christ. I don't know what's going to happen either, but God's got something for you to do. He's got something new, something exciting. And it's when we get a fresh vision of what God wants to do in your heart and life that things, business picks up. What is it that God wants for you right now? For some of you, it's faithfulness to his, uh, to his word, faithfulness to prayer, faithfulness to witness. For some of you, you need, to, you need to reconcile some relationships, some fractured relationships. You need to get some things right with people. For some of you, you need to go back and pick up the things you used to do. For some of you, you need to get back to that gratitude journal. Get it back out again. For some of you, you need to go to somebody and get things worked out. Whatever it is, God's desiring to do something new in your life. Don't let the mistakes of the past bog you down for going, from going where God wants you to go. You can't do anything about it except ask for forgiveness from God. And move forward. He said, I want you to know I've, I've done all these kind of things for you. I, I've went through you. I, the water, I was there. The fire, I was there. And I'll be with you tomorrow. Some of you are so worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. Forfeit the future to God. Let him handle it. Let him take care of it. You know what? He will. He will.